Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our webinar, um, Climb to Success. We are going to be talking about some exciting things in this webinar as part of our ongoing on base camp series. Um, I am very excited to be introducing our hosts for today, um, Scott and Andy. They're going to be incredible and they're going to be sharing some great insights and uh, talking to our panelists about all things. IT technical teams, all things on base. Um, so with that, Andy, Scott, I'll let you guys uh, take it away. Sure, hi, I'm Andy Rutledge. I am a senior software engineer here at DataBank. Um, I've been with DataBank for about five years and I have recently become the product lead for our software development products. And I'm also Azure certified uh, for that particular cloud environment. Um, um, I've been asked to explain what my favorite emoji is. My favorite emoji is definitely the horns, uh, as I'm really big into rock music, metal music, and the horns definitely recommend or represent uh, good times for me. So I am joined by Scott McLean. Well, hi, everybody. I'm Scott McLean, and uh, I manage the development team here at DataBank. I've been with the company for a little bit over 11 years, uh, been working with OnBase for 18 years, and been writing code for 30 years. So uh, I'm an old timer, and uh, I'll prove just how old I am by mentioning that my favorite emoji is the thumbs up. Now we can pass it on to our uh, panelists. And for each of you guys, as you introduce yourselves, why don't you uh, not only tell us what you do here at DataBank, but if you could only eat one thing for the rest of your life, what would it be? Hi, uh, my name is Chris Massey. I'm a business analyst with DataBank. I've been with DataBank for two years. Um, I've been doing on-base stuff since 2003, so quite a while at multiple capacities, if you will. Uh, the one food choice would probably be sushi because it's well balanced with a few varieties of uh, of uh, different uh, vitamins, if you will. All right. Well, I'm Liz Kolseth, a program manager here at DataBank, coming up on nine years. Um, and a lot of my work involves uh, anything from discovery design all the way through implementations with our, our clients within the public sector. Um, if I could only eat one thing the rest of my life, next to sushi, like Chris, I would say oysters. Anytime I can get oysters, I'm all for it. Hey, everybody. My name is Brianna Contreras, and I am a solution engineer here at DataBank on the professional services team, um, namely the commercial team. So I build out a lot of solutions and help to help to improve uh, processes with our, our clients. I've been with DataBank for about four years now um, and the on-base products for, I don't know, probably about seven or eight at this point. And I feel like if I could eat anything, I'm gonna be a little bit different here. Um, pizza, <laughs> you could put anything on a pizza and, and have variety and it's always delicious. So definitely pizza. Outstanding. Little piece of uh, administrivia for everyone. Uh, don't forget that we have two additional on base camp events coming up. Uh, on March 15th, we have using automation to drive your ROI. And on April 12th, we have a discussion of content intelligence. Here's a brief overview of today's uh, agenda. We're going to discuss the retention challenges that IT leaders face, uh, especially in today's market. We're going to talk about a thing that we call the plateau when we uh, reach a level and just aren't growing any further. And talk about how to keep our strongest team members well equipped to do the job. And we're going to discuss a hybrid approach of both building a team and amplifying it through the services that can be brought to others. Finally, we'll give you guys plenty of time to ask some questions and give you some answers. I'd like to pass it off to Andy to uh, introduce the first topic. 
All right, staff retention. It's always important to keep your people, to keep your good people at your company or organization. And we have some statistics about retention here on the screen that you can see. 73% um, of senior IT leaders say acquiring talent has never been harder, according to ZDNet. The average cost to hire an IT worker versus their salary is three to four times, which is pretty unbelievable. Uh, the turnover in the U.S. attributed to technical roles is about 20 percent, and the estimated open IT positions nationwide are 223,000. So it's it's hard to retain folks, according to these statistics. And for the big question number one for our panelists are, what are the challenges we see clients facing in terms of talent acquisition and hiring today? Uh, Liz, let's start with you. Oh, so as far as, you know, my experience and working with some of our clients and the retention um, topic, it is difficult to, you know, have someone on staff, someone that maybe my team works with for a number of years. You have all of that background, all of that knowledge. And it could just be one person in that role and they get burnt out. Um, being burnt out and managing that, like let's say for an on-base system, um, for example, all on your own can, can become very fatiguing. And, and I feel, you know, just putting all of that on one person and all of the desires that may be coming from the business units can be, can be a lot to handle. So um, after so long, the burnout is a real thing. And that's, that's where I've seen us coming in and, and trying to help and the knowledge transfer and everything that goes along with that when, when someone does become burnout in that role. All right, Chris, let's move along to you. Yeah. Uh, similar to what Liz was saying, but, you know, hiring folks that actually know the technology, you know, is something that, that folks look for and, and kind of hard to find in, in some spaces, too. Um, and the thing is, with this particular solution, it, it's not just being, um, you know, IT technology driven, but you really have to be a good communicator, a good listener, uh, inquisitive, um, those kind of behaviors and skills. So you're not really sitting behind desk and coding, but you have to be a cheap listening agent as well. So finding that well-versed talent is, is essential for a real successful solution deployment. Um, and that's you know kind of the balance with my role anyways. Um, and I, I actually provide AMP services uh, for the organizations too. Um, it, it's that balance of knowing the technology and really being able to get into there and listen to what, what, the, what the needs are and deploy the right solutions. So I think when, when we're putting those positions out, it's hard to hire just the technology piece and not get the business side or, or vice versa. All right, Brianna, do you have anything to add? I do, um, in a way where I kind of want to piggyback off of both of those as a good combination. Um, not only the burnout from essentially handling so many tasks and uh, really being a subject matter, a subject matter expert on so many different things, um, but I would say that a large number of things that I work with also have a, essentially almost like outdated technology um, applications that are in, in need of updating and upgrading. Um, sometimes it's just really hard to find people that have knowledge back to some of those applications without having to, you know, really dig deep into what the solutions are um, when you're hiring somebody on, especially maybe like a like a newly out of college, um, somebody who's just entering the field, they might not have the experience with some of those older applications and it'll get harder to find somebody who's still, who's still uh, versed in some of those things that, that need to be upgraded. Gotcha. And Scott, did you have anything you would like to say? Sure, actually there's, there's, there's one main thing that we've kind of left out, which is uh, IT, regardless of our reputation for being trolls who live in a back room and just uh, churn out code, IT is a very collaborative field. Um, we achieve more when we're surrounded by other people who do something similar. And one of the disadvantages a lot of uh, client organizations are at is that 
on base is a relatively specialized niche area. And so usually the on base team is not very large. We, of course, have the huge advantage that people are working collectively among a group of peers who all work on this same technology. But it can be very hard, especially in a small organization when someone's working solo. Um, Liz brought up the, the, the burnout factor. When you're stuck being just an island unto yourself without anybody else to you know kind of help you out when your skills reach their limit, it can be a really hard field to work in. Gotcha. Um, Scott, would you like to cover uh, one of our topics, the plateau? Sure, absolutely. So the the plateau, of course, you know, if we think about this in the physical world, you're climbing, you're climbing, you're climbing, and then you come to a flat space. And IT is very much like that. We improve, we grow, we get bigger, and then suddenly find we find ourselves stagnated. There's some obstacle that's getting in the way. And we call that the plateau. And that can last, you know, only a, only a few months. Or sometimes it can last multiple years. So it's a really challenging thing to uh, overcome. And uh, when you have teams who are hitting their plateaus, management really has to do some uh, you know, strategizing to help figure out how to get past that. And I'd like to uh, start out with, uh, um, I'm gonna start out with Chris this time. What are your thoughts on some things that people can do to avoid or surpass the plateau? Sure. Well, I mean, as you were saying, with maintenance, it sort of seems to take over the world because if you get production issues, then then things start, you know, raising alarms, if you will. Uh, so really making sure that you're staffed appropriately. And staffed meaning, you know, again, having services outside of your immediate control or whatever to contract in, um, and get the help needed to support the growth and development of the solution because it is an investment. And there are ways to take advantage of it, but if you're stuck in maintenance mode, it's tough to look beyond that cloud, if you will. Um, and really invest in R&D time, like the teammates, you know, if they're already taxed out with maintenance mode, again, staffing issue. So how do you get them to learn more about the solution so they can develop it better and not have to sit there and maintain it because maybe there's just some new enhancements uh, to redevelop. Nice, insightful. Liz, I think you might even have a story for us about this. <laughs> oh, I could I could tell lots of stories, but going <laughs> right along what what Chris was uh, mentioning, you know, just not having that time to uh, devote to your continued education and learning, you know, what what you can do with the particular software. So having the staff that allows allows you to be able to focus in on, you know, if it might be you're the, the person doing the configuration, having a partner on staff that can help you do the analysis and the design of what whatever it might be that the business units are looking to either improve with an existing solution or expand upon. Um, let's say they get an awesome solution and they're like, now what do we do? You've got to have a team to support that and, and to drive those initiatives to, to further expand, not only in an existing business unit, but another business unit that's caught wind and heard how awesome, you know, we've been able to enhance their business process. Outstanding. Andy, we haven't, uh, we haven't asked you anything yet from the standpoint of a uh, developer. What are your thoughts on uh, surpassing the plateau? Right. We'll get into this a little bit on the next slide, but I'd also like to point out that uh, you can get stuck in kind of a plateau if you have your less experienced members uh, not paired up with your stronger team members. So it's it's your 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 less experienced folks, your folks who haven't been with an organization for a very long time, can only grow so much if they're not pushed by. Um, pushed or or led by uh, stronger developers or stronger employees in your organization uh, to kind of get them over that plateau. They can only grow so far on their own. Uh, you know, and management can only do so much to to grow a, an employee, but uh, their peers are very important as well. Outstanding. Why don't you uh, go ahead and just keep the mic and. Uh... 
lead us into our next topic. All right. So enabling your team, uh, equipping your teams with the right tools is important. Leveraging automation when possible. And not, not always using automation. Obviously, uh, employees and, and staff are important, but automation is great when you can use it. Eliminating those old legacy processes and putting, like I mentioned, your strongest team members on the projects that matter. Uh, so the big question here is what tools and resources are needed by your teams? Uh, Scott, we'll start with you. Oh, sure. Um, I mean, obviously, uh, technology is is in there. You know, you don't want to you don't want to have somebody who's trying to do day to day work in 2023 working with Windows XP. But much more important than the technology, honestly, is the training. Um, part of the challenge of the IT role in general is that we live in an evolving space and knowing something today does not mean we are prepared for the job we have to do in six months. And from a leadership standpoint, understanding that all of our people are in that same position and that they need to be exposed to those new ideas, whether through formal training, whether through pairing them with more experienced uh, um, engineers, as you were talking about, or whatever it is that we can do, keeping that you know information flowing in is, in my opinion, the most vital component of uh, team enablement. All right, uh, Liz, what do you have to say about enabling our team? Well, just what Scott was mentioning about giving them the team members the opportunity to to equip themselves and gain that knowledge. We need to talk about implementing that knowledge. I often hear of uh, admin on base administrators going to so many hours of training, obtaining certifications, but then they have no outlet to actually um, flex those new those new skills that they've just learned through all of that training. So um, I think I think just going um, the next step in promoting you know what we can now do, maybe starting small um, and 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 growing those skills through through some smaller projects leading up to larger ones is the next step in in enabling your team to, to, to actually move forward and implement all of the knowledge that they might be might be pulling in. All right, Chris, what do you think about uh, team enabling? Yeah, I mean, spot on as far as being able to get the training and stuff, but I've also heard story after story about leadership not being engaged in the real investment, so not allowing training, which is even a, a, a more devastating event, right? So leadership, um, having to uh, make the commitment for maintaining the software, they have to maintain that time allowance and training for the team supporting it too. Uh, that's that's going to build on your retention because they're green and growing and not ripe and rotting, right? So that's a, that's a huge thing uh, is making sure leadership is engaged, knowing the time and back to what Liz was saying, that playtime, research and development, because they're only going to get stronger by practicing um, and you don't want them to practice on that big enterprise project. Bring out those small wins and make sure that the team, if you can have a team of larger than one, uh, is practicing those different modules, right? Like OnBase has tons of modules and we will see our experts lean on the modules they're most uh, comfortable with. You gotta really make sure the leadership is coaching the teams to get outside that uh, uh, comfort zone. All right, uh, Brianna, what are your thoughts? Uh, really along the same lines of, of training and communication, but I want to bring it a little bit outside of just even even like your on-base team. Um, training and communication amongst several different teams. Like for instance, if you you want to leverage your people to do the things that they're best at. So if you get bogged down with, with really basic tickets that are just eating up time, uh, user a profile creation, setting up simple tasks, you can use your training and communication to bring in maybe some other team members, your help desk teams, certain people, a subject matter expert from a, a certain part of the business that can take on small administrative tasks that are just eating away at the time to be able to do the bigger projects. Um, and that's where, you know, training and communication, we can utilize 
little things that, I mean, as an admin, you might be focused on just knock out the task, knock out the task and move on to the next thing. But if you take the time to really explain those tasks and bring in other members that can understand the process, it can take away from you having to work on those later on and having to troubleshoot items that can be done elsewhere and free up your time. So training and communication can really work across a lot of different areas of the business. Scott, did you have some further thoughts on this subject? Yeah, I mean, I don't want us to ignore that one uh, bullet point that we're all talking around with legacy processes there. One of the probably most devastating things that I see uh, in organizations when it comes to being stuck on the, on, on the plateau we talked about before, and when it comes to having a team who isn't enabled to take it farther, is falling into the, the idea of, well, we've always done it this way. Um, having that, having the ability to set aside the way you've done a thing, even if that thing has been successful long term, and look at the possibilities of doing things in new ways, um, it can be a huge uh, change in terms of how a team reacts and how well equipped they feel to progress um, is another one of those things that's an advantage that we have because we have so many minds in this you know small space where we constantly have people contributing new thoughts about how a thing could be done and you know it just didn't want to leave that one alone before we moved on gotcha scott if you want to retain the mic and lead us into our next next topic uh, sounds great um, the essentials for building a healthy IT culture. And, you know, culture is one of those buzzwords that we uh, um, uh, throw, throw around a lot. And some of us don't even really quite understand what it means because we tend to think of, uh, um, we tend to think of culture as something outside of work, something we experience in our lives. But Inside of, uh, of, of an organization and at the team level, it's really important to have a healthy culture in IT. Um, and what I'd like the panelists to speak on is what are some key ways that we can both build and maintain a healthy team culture? And, um, you know, you haven't started any of these, Andy, so why don't you kick us off with your comments? Certainly. Uh, one of the uh, key words on our subtitle of our presentation is the word equip. And that is you, you know, you give your employees, your IT team, you give your, your folks um, the equipment they need, literally the equipment they need to get their job done. And that includes, you know, a fast computer when it comes to a lot of um, various environments for your servers, dev, test, and prod. Dev and tests need to be pretty bulky as well. If you want folks to get their job done, uh, there's not, there's, you know, people often forget that those dev and test servers are 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 still used by folks for the development and for the testing. They're not just um, uh, secondary um, pieces of equipment. They're very important. So it's good to have, uh, in addition to all of the, you know, um, things that you want to build a culture with, the equip part is very important. Outstanding. Chris, how about your thoughts? Yeah, I, I feel that's super important, obviously, for the equipment side, because I think, uh, you know, IT gets the scraps, not the, uh, the leading edge, if you will. Uh, but, but more importantly is, you know, they're people too, right? So <laughs> remembering that, you know, IT are not robots. They are there to help enable the, the business areas and they have needs um, and need support too. It really kind of goes full circle back to the showing, um, showing support in their training, uh, development, and, and cohesiveness of the team, sharing ideas, uh, cross-pollinating, make sure there's peer reviews happening, and just have fun with it. Uh, don't get, um, always lean on this employee who's really the master, so always bring them on that critical project. You're never going to really get the evolution of the team in, in, in itself. And the folks who are never pulled into those projects will likely say, well, my, I'm feeling, uh, not as valued. So uh, just make sure like, you know, that there's a good pulse on how the team um, nature is and what their real needs are at the human level. Excellent. Liz, how about you? 
I actually, I love this question because it's something I'm pretty passionate about and something I have, I have so many stories to back it up, but just overall in general, building that healthy culture goes back to having the team, having a team that consists of individuals that can take on different elements of the project. And one that I've started seeing more of is having a project manager, somebody on that on base or process improvement team. I've seen it called a process improvement team too, which is super important. And just for the overall culture um, to understand that there is a team dedicated to process improvement, but having somebody leading up that team in maybe a project management capacity, like I mentioned, um, understanding the priorities and the amount of work that that team can carry up can carry out. Um, that, that helps prevent the burnout that we've talked about. Um, it also helps other business units that might have interest in hopping on the process improvement bandwagon with this group. Um, it lets them understand where they might be priority wise and they can, they can prepare and get their staff ready to go once they might be up, up on the, in, in line with the priorities. Um, one other item to call out in this, in just promoting that healthy and exciting culture is celebrating those wins, letting this team call out and maybe even present some metrics on what they can do and how they did it. So letting them celebrate those, those, those projects, those wins and, and getting the recognition that they deserve. Outstanding. Andy, why don't you uh, take us into our next topic? Uh, certainly. I actually believe Caleb had something he wanted to uh, oh bring up if he's if we have the time for it. Yeah. Surprise yeah. goodness. We definitely have the time for it. Um, so in the spirit of us talking about teams and building healthy teams, um, I had some all-star trivia questions for um, everyone in the audience. So uh, we're going to take the next few minutes and uh, go through some of those and love to see some of your responses. The first question I wanted to ask was, when did the Dream Team win the Olympic gold medal? Um, can you all see that question on your screen? It is not displayed. Let me try this. You know what? It's looking like these questions um, aren't operating, but I do have one question for you guys that uh, will operate. So I will throw this out there. Oh, it has already been answered. So what is the name of the soccer team or football team coached by Ted Lasso? Um, People are currently answering this question. I'll give you a few more seconds. All right. So between Manchester United, Liverpool, Barcelona, and AFC Richmond, the winner for this one is AFC Richmond. So congratulations to the 35% of people that answered that question correctly. Um, all right. Well, since the other questions don't appear to be working, uh, we will move on to the next portion of the webinar. So Scott and Andy, I'll let you guys take it away. Uh, Scott, your the hybrid idea. approach is, uh, you know, it's a, an idea that's more than just a team. Um, and this touches on all of the things that we talked about before the uh, question break. And what we talk about when we're saying a hybrid approach, we're talking about a blend of your team doing the things that they're strongest at and bringing in additional people, whether through amplification services, staff augmentations, or whatever method is uh, you know, appropriate to the task in order to elevate what the team can do as a whole. So the big question here is, 
What advice do our panelists have for organizations who might want to work with this hybrid approach? And there's a little sub question for this one. How have you seen this work in organizations? And uh, Brianna, we haven't heard from you in a minute. Would you like to kick us off? Sure. Um, I actually, I have a lot of work that I do with the amplification services and the staff augmentations. So I will say, um, I mean, for the hybrid approach, we're here to support your team being the best that they can be. Um, whether that be providing assistance with completing tasks that you just need an extra hand or like another another set of eyes, even just some fresh ideas, um, or even just offloading some work that maybe you don't have time for. Um, if we're here to do whatever needs to be done. Um, I work regularly with a company that we do amplification services for. And I mean, as a little bit of a story, I guess I can say we, um, we provide services for them almost like a like another employee that's on site for them. We we are here to help their their users, to help their other IT teams. Um, it is actually we're so heavily integrated with them that most of their employees have no idea that we aren't actually an employee at that company because we're just there to help them get things done and keep moving and improve their processes. So the hybrid approach in some of these scenarios can can really just be completely seamless to make sure that you guys do that that everybody can do the best be the best that they can be. Outstanding, uh, Liz. What are your thoughts? Well, everything that Brianna just said, I I 100% agree with. I see that in a lot of the implica implication services engagements that I'm I'm involved with as well and just just being there to support the team and making it as seamless as possible that could be you know getting getting us in and we're we're on teams we're we're part of a, a group chat you know we're there to back you up and and help ensure that you're not you're not feeling overwhelmed you're getting to those priorities and and you're you're as successful as possible. Um, even getting into a help desk ticketing system, assigning those cases right to us and, and making it as, as, as seamless as possible as we help and, and push those teams forward um, in resolving any backlog or, or priority items that might be on the agenda. Thanks. Chris? Yeah, this, this is an extremely exciting topic for me. Um, my tenure at Databank has been as part of AMP services with a, a customer uh, pretty much for the full duration. Uh, and my prior experience is trying to hire teams and get them there and then get folks into augment services has always been an interesting challenge. Um, so I've taken my past experiences and making sure <laughs> working with Databank, I can apply what I would be looking for in that hiring and so just like they had said it's really being part of that that team with the organization and it's a partnership uh it's building trust making sure they trust in they're paying for the service make sure they trust what you're doing um and quite frankly you know the the organization can learn from us with all the experiences we have and our approach and then our role is to make sure that we're learning all those um institutional knowledge components and history, right? We have to learn the history lessons of this organization. So, you know, my approach is to go in and listen, see what they need, and take my experiences and skills to move their solutions forward. And like the panelists were saying, I'm involved in their team chat. I know everybody's birthday, weather, everything, you know, just be one with it. It's not treated like uh, you're a contractor. Uh, and I think that would be, you know, the approach would be use the, use the skills where you can take advantage of them. Don't put them just on like you would do an intern or something, <laughs> dead weight projects or those things. If you need them to chip away at items, makes sense. But remember uh, the services that you're paying for and looking at the experience and the breadth of resources we have to bring to the table is incredible. Yeah, and I think it's, I think it's really important to focus a lot on that ability to bring in that disparate skill set 
But you know, there's an area that we haven't talked about that's frequently an obstacle for our clients where the hybrid approach can be a mm-hmm. huge advantage to them. And that's when there are aggressive timelines. Sometimes the, <clears throat> the due date for a project is <clears throat> the make or break definition of success. It's not how good it's done, it's when. Um, any thoughts on that from the panelists? How about how about you, Liz? I know you confront deadlines all the time. Often we have a lot of deadlines with fiscal years, or you know, a contract might be coming up uh, with an expiration that's fast approaching. And also just getting started in in my experience with the public sector specifically, contracts can take a while. So you're losing time just waiting for something to get approved. So once we finally do get in, uh, I I always try to ensure you know we're ready to go as soon as you know day one starts that we're able to to start whatever the first activity might be. But I also have a team behind me. I never like to be single threaded. I never want just one resource. I want to put multiple resources on there and get to that work as quickly as possible. Um, You never know what might come up in the future. You want to just make sure you're covered. And then also having access to our specialty services team. There might be a need for a a custom script or a web service, something like that. I've got access to that team and I can tap into them with a day's notice and we're off and running with whatever, whatever is needed to to keep moving forward with the the solution that we're trying to put in place. Outstanding. I see a question that's popped up from an anonymous attendee and it says, uh, are there best practices for handling on-base coding changes in a non-production environment and then moving those changes to a production environment? They said that they feel like they seem to uh, address changes twice, once in non-prod and once in prod. Um, any thoughts on that from the standpoint of how the hybrid approach could enable a client to do that? How about you, Chris? Yeah, I mean, so I improving think, the, the prod to, or the test to prod. Yeah, I think every environment uh, seems to have these type of challenges. And, and so really that coordination is there because even when you move things from, from your different environments, as much as you want everything to translate beautifully, you still got to double check some of those components. So um, unfortunately, it's, it's really just making sure you have that bandwidth, right? The timing and the skill sets to take the time to make sure you're watching those migrations um, and planning and communication. And I think where some of this falls short, quite frankly, is not having enough resource or enough time to, you know, check that, you know, dot the I's and cross the T's, if you will. Um, I don't know, Liz, if you have any other, or, or Brianna, actually, yeah. uh, on that SME side, if you will, the SEs. I do have something to add there. Um, just having the time and in between yeah. your non-production and your production, you need testing. And often I find it difficult to get those subject matter experts or those power users into to fully test uh, a change or a, a new solution before it makes it into the production environment. So just working with the sponsors from the business unit to secure the, the time of your testers is vital to a successful production um, environment deployment. And then being able to take the time to document each of your steps, any little tweak that might occur during that testing phase, keeping it all documented um, and ready for kind of your roadmap to migrating that solution into production when you get to that point. Outstanding. And Brianna, I saw your microphone flash off of mute. I'm guessing you might have something to add. I do. I have one extra thing I think I'd like to add. I mean, other than the documentation, which is definitely important, so we know everything that was changed and the tweaks that were made during testing. Um, But I mean, to swing back to the hybrid approach from the data bank perspective, um, I would say that especially for certain solutions, so every solution is going to be handled a little bit differently between the move from test to production, um, whether you have to re-key everything that you've done or if you could use import-export services. But I would say having the teams that we do behind us at Databank, sometimes we could say this piece that involves workflow, work view, certain scan thing is that we can reach out to other people internally and say, what 
have you guys seen was the best way to transfer this particular type of solution? What were the pros and cons from other times that you've had to do this? Do you see a benefit from doing it one way versus another? And we have those kinds of resources internally where people are constantly moving things um, for different projects and we can reach out and see what has gone well and what has not and kind of take that with us into, into moving those solutions onward. We can know we're expecting to see something go kind of awry if we move it with this particular way versus just hand keying something to avoid, you know, a, a, a particular uh, issue that we might have. Excellent. Thanks for that. Looks like we've actually got another question. We might we might be ready to move to that next slide, where we, which which invites these questions that are starting to roll in. Um, this, of course, is the "Ask Us Anything" section here. Um, we do have one more question ready, uh, and the question here is: Is there ever going to be training on SQL scripting, or is there a training that you recommend for this type of uh, information? Jump right in any of our panelists. I don't need to pick on you if you have thoughts on on how to, how to learn about SQL. If you're the kind of person that likes online courses, um, there's a lot of them that are out there that are step by step, um, kind of from various levels of experience, from no experience with SQL to you know an expert learning you know the the details of how to how to write SQL for different platforms and that sort of thing. Um, there's a number of online courses that describe that. I'm trying, I'm trying to think of the one that, um, I used for, um, for technology stuff. I can't think of the name of the one off the top of my head, unfortunately, but if you just do like an online search for SQL training, there's a, a lot of different examples from a number of reputable sources. Uh, you can, you can get ratings on each of those to figure out like, what's the, what's the best, uh, uh, course there, but if you're in if you're into online training, that's the way to go. Uh, if you're not, you know, an SQL book uh, would be a, a good. Um, O'Reilly is a very good publishing company. They have a lot of good um, technical books for training and sort and uh, such things. So those are a couple of uh, options that you have at your disposal. Excellent. I know back in the uh, dim mists of antiquity when I. Uh, uh, first went to work for Highland before I came to Databank, the first day we showed up, they uh, handed us a coffee cup and a copy of Teach Yourself SQL in 20 Minutes. Uh, and, uh, you know, that idea of just following a basic tutorial or a basic book to get your knowledge of just the fundamentals of query writing um, is a hugely successful launching off point for kind of digging into the int intricacies of um, SQL itself. If the question is more about understanding writing SQL queries for OnBase, there are a couple of techniques that you can use there as well. A lot of folks don't know that Highland actually outside of the MRGs also publishes a reporting guide, which we can help you put your hands on, that describes where a lot of things are located in the OnBase database, in particular the things you might want to report on license consumption, uh, what what document types are using a given keyword, things like things like that can be really easy to get at from that. And then there's a secret trick that some of us use, which is that if you turn on verbose logging in your config module, you can actually see the SQL queries that are being written and learn a lot about your on-base database that way. Anybody else have anything to add on that one? No, that was that was perfect. I was going to say the uh, the guide, the reporting uh, guide, if you will, is is what seems to be uh, largest hang up because it's a very complex database. So that's definitely a, a huge asset for those looking to uh, report out and develop queries and such. I'd like to add one more thing on top of the verbose and the, the reporting guides. Um, one thing that has definitely helped me also is uh, if you own reporting dashboards, um, there are dashboards that come with that solution. And sometimes just opening up what was already configured by Highland and looking at the processes and the way that they're querying the database in those, those reports um, will help you just kind of gauge how 
the best way to go about writing those reports, like which tables are going to contain what on top of the reporting guide, but also how those things connect to each other. I mean, when you go to the main table, what kind of what kind of pieces and columns you're going to use to connect to other tables. And aside from that, I mean, the reporting dashboards MRG does have some info on how to write those queries, um, what the the different pieces are to those those reports and how to build them. So there's kind of a, a bunch of different pieces you can pool together to get that information. Excellent. So another question that, that just came up that uh, actually has a lot to do with working with amplification services is how do you approach security and data privacy when you're implementing outsourcing or staff augmentations in an IT organization? You know, that's a tough one, right? From my experiences as working with organizations where I'm, you know, being an outside resource used internally, they tend to treat us just like employees. Um, they have to follow all the same, all the same um, rules and regulations as the employees do, go through all the compliance training that, are, that is necessary for every employee. You know, the outside resource still gets, um, gets, uh, gets treated like, like, like a person that works there. Um, uh, on a permanent basis and not just a temporary resource. Yeah, I'm speaking at the, you know, doing it for two years straight at, at a particular client on the public sector. Uh, again, had to go through all the same certifications, if you will, um, and just make sure you uh, <laughs> treat the data correct. I'm logged into their system all the time, all day. Uh, you know, uh, my, my data bank equipment is just a uh, conduit to get there, quite frankly. I would definitely have to back that up. I, I mean, I, for a lot of mine, I, I VPN into systems just the same way as if you had an employee who was working from home that day. Um, and then I will say, just like just like you guys did the trainings and the certifications, those yearly security uh, trainings that everybody has to take, I feel like I do about 12 of those a year for both mm -hmm. Databank and all of the different customers. So, I mean, we're we're doing the same things that, that the actual users the employees at the company are doing right i mean again back to the ampl amplification services piece and, and you talk about the hybrid approach you know the biggest thing is you know go back to that word trust i mean obviously you have security policies and procedures but you have to have a partner in, in this type of engagement if you can't trust them then they shouldn't be in your house kind of thing you know yeah absolutely one one other thing you know to keep in mind especially when you're looking to augment an existing team is that it's really important to be working with a partner who is conversant with and certified in the same uh, security protocols and policies that you are required to follow. Now, um, it may be appealing to pick up the really inexpensive technician over at Billy Ray's Bait Tackle and Software, but at the end of the day, you want somebody who is already compliant. Um, if you're working with uh, PII, PHI, the, the sorts of things that really put people in, you know, in, in danger when it's disclosed, working with an organization that already has a policy, that has methods in place for secure transfer and storage to prevent any um, unplanned exposure of information can be a critical uh, decision maker in choosing a partner to work with for staff augmentations. Another question can be, um, how do you demonstrate across those, uh, those barriers that often exist between departments within an organization, how do you demonstrate the wins and the value that they bring, especially in terms of using uh, amplification services? I, I can speak to organization I'm with. I mean, we knocked out. 60 some odd projects um, and that that just screamed to leadership the success of this particular type of engagement because they were stuck in that plateau. They were in maintenance mode. They were barely keeping things alive on the day to day. Uh, the business areas, the, the agencies were clamoring, hammering, saying, we know we own this tool. Uh, we think we know what it can do. Um, and these tickets are backing up for these initiatives. And none of them, 
you know, some were larger in size, but most were just enhancing the basic world because their process and the agency had changed, but they didn't have bandwidth to make those small keyword changes or, or talk type name changes and things like that just because of the day-to-day, -day, um, which is a big, big disservice. And the other benefit was, is when I was engaging with the agencies, is I had the opportunity to show them even more. What they thought they knew about OnBase was nothing of what they knew. Uh, they were still on uh, file store retrieve type of functionality and a lot of folks we moved into a much more robust type of solution because it, it made sense they were ready for it but that's a lot of engagements uh folks working with on base is this basic file you know scan store retrieve uh, as their introduction before they get into that sort of workflow and then your dot com and things like that so it's just it's really Amazing to watch these agencies so hungry for more of it. And now the projects are just ticking back up for the simple fact that they now understand the capabilities and want more from it, which is great because now they're just maximizing their investment and not sitting there with a tool rusting. Excellent. All right. Uh, we got kind of one final question for our panel, and that is, uh, how do you work with organizations that may have another IT department within? Yeah, so that's a that's a really um, important question because um, one of the things that that you know uh, is very true in business in general but especially true in IT is that we tend to, we tend to be very territorial. Um, this server is mine and, and none shall pass. Um, and having an understanding of the roles that exist on an IT team, um, especially understanding them at differing scales can be a really vital skill in making AMP services meaningful because when we can walk into, into an organization and understand, you know, this is a person who's responsible for databases. This is a person who's responsible for the network infrastructure and being able to respect those boundaries and understand when to loop those people into the conversation can be really critical in kind of not not so much breaking down those walls because we have to let those people be a little bit territorial, but instead just building windows in them so that we can at least talk across the the, the boundary. Um, any thoughts from anybody else? I think you you kind of started to touch upon this, but keeping those other individuals in IT, um, I, one example being a database, um, a DBA not stringing them along through every meeting, letting them know that they need to become engaged at such and such time. They're very, they're very um, protective and conscious of their time being spent. So just making sure that they're engaged at the right times and understanding uh, what the plan is when, when they're, they're ready to become engaged. Always, always having some planning and hashing out, you know, proper procedures and methods that 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 person in their their role with an IT would would recommend or appreciate is is always a, a good way to build that partnership. For sure. Yeah, that's it. You know, know the stakeholders in the environment, um, and, and then, like you said, Scott, being being tactful in your way of communicating and how to engage them at the right time and let them know the the what's in it for you kind of thing. Because at the end of the day, um, typically AMP services is, is a, is a short-term engagement, but it, again, it kind of goes back to that trust and the partnership. And if you treat it like the partnership and show that it's not about uh, consuming roles or, or removing responsibilities, it's not, a, it's really partnership. We all have a common goal to make sure this asset is utilized to the best of its capability. And, and we need you to help support a certain component of it, please help, you know, and I think going at it with the right human mind um, certainly breaks the bread easier. Absolutely. I'd like to add on to that, that please help kind of thing is definitely um, when you reach out to people, I, I've noticed that it's helpful to go in more with, um, I, 
I'm looking, we're looking to complete this tasks, a uh, list of tasks, and uh, we think we're going to need some assistance from you if you don't mind, you know, coming together. I mean, and this is, you know, more of a heads up, like we're, we're going to plan out some sort of upgrade or something that's going to happen. And we know we're going to need networking teams or database teams. And you just got to give them the heads up up front that this is coming down the line instead of just giving it to them at the end of the day, like we're doing this tomorrow. Um, but also approaching them with, you know, kind of like the respectfulness of, I know that this is your area of expertise and I'm coming into this. Can we just sit down and talk about what is going to happen? And can you, you know, walk me through some things or, or really just asking them to share some knowledge on the situation up yeah. front before you work together to get to the end task? Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, I've seen, uh, I'll say it carefully, you know, failure in projects because utilized contractors are like, I need, this is what I need, this is what you need to do. And that is not well received. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure we've all experienced it on one one end or another of it. And I think, you know, those hearing those horror stories and being involved in them, um, hiring contractors made me well more prepared for my particular role here and how not to behave. Not like I would have anyways, but you know, what I mean it's like that that but we can all relate to that. I'm sure the the, the audience can certainly shake their head if they want to. Outstanding contributions across the board. You panelists are fantastic today. Let's talk a little bit about uh, some resources that we can make available to you to understand uh, amplification services as a whole and where we can play a role in that. Uh, we do have a uh, blog posted that kind of uh, gives you a, uh, a guide or a roadmap to how to uh, improve the experience for your IT team. Another one on the building blocks for increasing productivity. That's getting past that plateau we were talking before. Lastly, we have one on amplification services itself and where it fits into things. And a video that we have that's available that goes through the amplification services offerings. All right, let's talk next steps. And we do offer a technical staffing analysis to discuss your team's resourcing needs and strategy and offering a free month of services with a 12 month AMP services agreement. Uh, the link to schedule one will be sent to you via email. So you'll re be receiving that for joining our webinar. And lastly, we'll talk about our next webinar Oh, we have one last question here. Uh, looks like Scott's going to cover it in the chat. While he's talking about that in the chat there, I'll discuss our next webinar. Uh, it's a discussion regarding how to use automation to find and drive ROI in your business processes. All right, everyone. Well, that will wrap up our webinar for today. Um, thank you all for joining us. Um, it was incredible just to be able to share our knowledge with you and um, and continue down this path of uh, on base camp and learning and growing in on base systems. So, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, thank everyone. You. Thanks, everybody.